On behalf of Pastor Phil and the family at Believer's Christian Church, we are excited to sow this message into your life. Our mission at Believer's is to love God, love people, and serve both. Our prayer is that through this message, you will receive revelation that will bring a lasting change into your life. To find out more about us, log on to BelieversChristianChurch.com. This morning, I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Jeremiah chapter 52. And could I ask you if you would, would you stand with me as we read the word together from Jeremiah chapter 52 and verse 31. Um, and we, we stand in honor of the word of God. Jeremiah 52. Now today I'm going to read with you from the Amplified Bible. So you may be reading from the King James or New King James or the NIV. But I'm going to read this passage from the Amplified Bible. And the Bible says, In the, 30, in the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiakim, also called Conaniah and Jeconiah, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 25th day of the month, evil Merodach, king of Babylon, in the first year of his reign, lifted up the head of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and showed favor to him and brought him out of prison. And he spoke kindly to him and gave him a seat above the seats of the kings who were captives with him in Babylon. And Joachim put off his prison garments, and he dined regularly at the king's table all the days of his life. And his allowance, I love this, this verse, and his allowance, a continual one, how many of you like a continual allowance? I like that. And his allowance, a continual one, was given him by the king of Babylon, a portion according to his requirements until the day of his death, all the days of his life. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you today in this house, in this place. Lord, we thank you today for your anointing being here. We thank you for minds being renewed. And we thank you today for faith being built in the hearts of people. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I do want to say before I begin on the passage how much I appreciate Pastor Philip and his leadership. The one thing that I felt last night when I, uh, it was Saturday evening last night, uh, when I walked in, I really mean this, because I go a lot of places, really all over the world, and it was amazing. When I walked in here, first of all, I was amazed by the community, this, this community of Eagle here, and I saw Maple Street. I thought at first I was in Mayberry. I mean, it felt good, right? It felt good. And then when I walked into the back of the church, there was just this spirit of excellence that I felt when I walked in here. And I mean this sincerely when I say this. I get a chance to go all over the place doing exactly what I'm doing today in all kinds of venues and uh, in churches. And the reason that I share this, very rarely do I meet a combination of excellence and what I would call level of maturity in a young man. I call him young because he's my son's age and my daughter's age. A young man that ha has that combination all in one package. And so I just want to say to you sincerely, I don't get anything out of this. I'm, like, I'm just telling you the truth. I'm just being authentic. I'm telling you, you should feel blessed and be blessed that you have someone like this God has sent you in this house to lead the church. I'm telling you, it's here. I feel it. My wife and I feel it. And I, I genuinely... I, I genuinely say that. I can assure you I don't say that everywhere I go. I can assure you. Now, I mean, I, I'm nice, but I don't say that. So, uh, so that's, a, that's really a big deal. I want to say that to you. So as we read Jeremiah chapter 52, this to me, I was, was reading this passage. I've told the other services in my devotions one day, and this just jumped out of me, out of me, this particular passage. I was just reading. You know how you take the Word of God, you just read? And, uh, and, and one day as I was reading, it just jumped out. And of course, I was doing it on my iPad, right? I have my regular Bible, which I still use. But I do a lot of my Bible study on my iPad because I can go to another translation instantly in, with my iPad. So here's what I did. I'm reading this, and it jumps out at me. So I push, I hit the button, right? Go to, right? Change your library. And I go, and I find the Amplified Bible within three seconds. I'm looking at the Amplified version that I just read to you. And so as I began to study this and began to dig into the scripture here, there was a couple of things that stood out. One was this king, whose name was Jehoiakim, had been in prison for 37 years. Now I want to tell you, no matter who you are, where you are, that's a long time. 
37 years in prison. That's a long time. In addition to that, the Bible said that this other king reached down after 37 years and pulled Jehoiakim up out of the prison, brought him up. But what was amazing to me about that was all the, it says, above all the other kings. So there evidently was a lot of other kings that were in prison as well that were captured, right? And they were in prison and God or the king here did not reach down and pull them up and bring them out. So I began to study about it. I said, Lord, help me understand here what's going on. And so as I began to dig into this, I discovered a couple of things. One was the meaning of the name Jehoiakim. His meaning or the name literally meant preparation. Or we could say it this way, stewardship. His evidently for 37 years, Jehoiakim had been doing something. He evidently wasn't sitting in the corner complaining. He evidently wasn't sitting in the corner and, and, and we, as we say down in South Texas and Texas, belly aching. He evidently was doing something intentional about what, what his life was about, where he was headed with his life. He evidently was stewarding his time in the prison. And because of that, the Bible said here, it says the king showed favor to him and brought him out of prison. See, what I'm convinced when we began to study this and look at this, all of these things that came to, to Jehoiakim, his allowance, a continual one, he was given new clothes. He ate at the king's table continually every day. In other words, his life was dramatically changed because of the favor of God on his life. And so today when we talk about the favor of God, I'm going to give you three things today quickly that will help you understand in your life how the favor of God works. And the first is this. And when we look at Jehoiakim's life, is that favor is attracted to a spirit of expectation and preparation. Favor is attracted to a spirit of expectation and preparation. Every morning when my wife and I get up, we have, I have a, a, a red prayer journal and I've changed different prayer journals over the years, you know, as you do, but I usually change one now every six months or so, maybe every year, but I put certain scriptures for the year in that prayer journal and I also put certain ways that we pray. I put confessions and declarations of faith in there, all of those things. And right in the very first page of my prayer journal, if I had it here, it's at the hotel room. If I had it with me today, I'd open it up and show you. In the very first one, we have seven things we pray. We call them pray out. We pray it out every morning. And at the very top, the very first one, every morning we pray out, after we read scripture, we pray out supernatural favor. That's the, that's the word we use, supernatural favor. And we say, Lord, we thank you today that we have supernatural favor in our life. And we thank you you're going before us with the faith favor of God, right? And we say Psalms 512 that says in the, in the New International Version says favor will surround you as a shield. So we say, Lord, today we declare that the favor of God goes before us. We declare we have supernatural favor and we thank you today, Lord, that favor surrounds us as a shield in our life. Now every morning we pray that. And we're intentional, we're on purpose, we believe it, and we speak it with the spirit of faith. In fact, I like to say it this way, I think, I think I've said this here, I don't know, because you know, I've been several places this week, but I like to say it this way, when I speak that, when we pray that, that supernatural favor and those other six things, let me encourage you to do this, take the sissy out of your voice. Huh? Now I know when we're in church, come on now. But it's okay to smile. It won't hurt anybody. But you've got to take the sissy out of your voice. In other words, you stand up and say, we are believing God today for supernatural favor. I mean, well, I'll just be bold here. We just tell the devil, take his hands off of whatever, and because he's already defeated, so I'm not going to mess with him. I'm going to speak the word over that situation, and I declare supernatural favor over our life, that nothing's going to stop the favor of God coming to us because of a spirit of expectation, and I believe through 
prayer the spirit of preparation or stewardship. So when I believe that, then favor gets attracted to my life, your life, our life. Here's Jehoiakim down in the pit of the prison and the king reaches down over all the other kings there and pulls him up. There's something about taking the sissy out of your voice and having a spirit of expectation and a spirit of preparation about where you're going. In this church, I sense the seed of greatness when I come in here. In this church, I sense the seed of favor. And what you say, what do you mean by that? I mean, you're a whole lot bigger right now in the spirit realm than what you're seeing in the natural realm. Here in this church, you're much bigger. The seed of greatness is in this house. What you must do every day is get up and pray over this house, over this church. Speak the word over your family. Pray over your business. Pray over your employment. Pray over your job. Speak the word of God over those things because favor is attracted to a spirit of expectation and preparation. Now, we like to tell the story, of course, of the parable of the talents, right? Right? And we know that, and just so that we're all together on the same page, the, literally in Matthew 25, when, we, when the King James Version uses the word talent, talent was a measure of money. You understand that? So when, he, when the master came and gave the first one five talents, we know that he was giving to that servant a certain measure of money. Now, we know the story. The story is the one with the five took that five talents and turned it into five more talents. Now he's got ten talents. And we know that the master came and gave the next servant two talents. We know he took the two talents and turned it into four talents. So now he's got four talents. But then he came to the one servant, right, the third servant, and the Bible says that he gave him one talent. Now, that servant did something interesting. He didn't take the one talent and turn it into two as an example of the others. He took the talent. The Bible says he dug a hole. He buried it, right, in his mind for safekeeping. But when the master came back, the the Bible says very plainly that the master took the one talent away from him that had done nothing with it, that took it and hid it in the ground. He took it away from him and gave it to him that had now the ten talents. Now, the question I always ask is, what did the person, the one, the servant with, who had five, turned it into five more, who now had ten talents, what did the servant with the ten talents do to get the one talent? And the answer is nothing. He spent his time preparing and investing to take the five and turn it into five more. But then God's supernatural favor and God's supernatural increase shows up in our lives. And when that shows up, then all of a sudden stuff just starts coming to us because the favor of God acts as an attractor or a magnet that brings those things to our life. I like to say it this way for the young folk in here today. You okay? Remember this, money is attracted, not pursued. You work harder on yourself than you do on your job. And if you work harder on yourself than you do on your job, then the things that need to come to you will come to you. Now, I'm not telling you 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 sit around and be lazy. What I'm saying is, is you work on yourself. You put the word of God in yourself. You renew your mind to the word. And then you begin to act on what that word says. As you do that, it will start coming to you. So the best things in life are attracted. And they're attracted through the favor of God. Favor shows up to a spirit of expectation and preparation. One of the things I like to say is that, and we've, we've lived long enough, and everybody in here knows, just so we're, we're, we're telling the truth and shaming the devil, right? I can't get any help, I'm trying, come on. We're gonna tell the truth, shame the devil. Right, so my wife is still 29. You understand that? And because she's 29, and she's been 29 for several birthdays, but she's still 29. Since she's 29, I'm 39, right? We're all right, right? <laughs> now, the truth is, we've lived long enough now that um, we have discovered there are some things that we don't know that we don't know. Let me say it to you one more time. We've lived long enough now 
that we have discovered there are some things that we don't know that we don't know. Right? I mean, we came to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan this week, right? We were in Traverse City, and then we went to uh, Petoskey and stayed. We actually had reservations at the Grand Hotel on Mackinac Island. We've never been to Mackinac Island. But when my office called and made the reservations, it was $725 a night. So I called back and said to her, no, tell them we don't want to buy the hotel. We just want a room. <laughs> I don't want to buy the hotel. I just want a room. Oh, they said, well, breakfast is included. I thought, what a deal. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to lower my sights. And I stayed at the, uh, I think it's called the Inn on Bay Harbor. And it's a very nice place, and we, had, we stayed right on the waterfront in our room and could sit in our room and watch the waves from Lake Michigan. And I thought, who would have ever thought of all these cherry trees that are up here? I never dreamed of an upper Michigan and going to Mackinac. We did go to Mackinac. I, did, I didn't dream of that. Then I found out you have maple syrup right here. You have maple trees. There's, I, I mean, I'm discovering every day there's things I don't know. Well, have you ever thought there may be some things about the favor of God you don't know? And have you ever thought there may be some things about how God will function in your life you may not know? Yes. Ever thought about that? I, th I told the story, in the, in, I think it was in the first service, or last night of one of them, that but several years ago my wife and I went to, were invited to a boat show uh, down in Florida. And so we go to this boat show. This was back when we were running several businesses at the same time and some other things. And so we were invited to this boat show. And so we, 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 we thought about buying this boat. And so you had to get approved to get on the boat. You know, financially, they had to, you had to get vetted before they would ever let you on to even see the boat. It was that kind of show. So we got on this boat, and I told my wife, I said, I think we could live in it because we had a certain business in a particular part of the country. And I said, I think when, when I'm out here doing business, instead of staying in a condo or something, I said, I, can, I, I think I can live on this boat. It's big enough. It's very comfortable. I think I can live on this boat. And so we, we looked at it very seriously, and the salesman said to me, he said, hey, you want to see a really a big boat? And I said, yeah. He said, come on. So we went with him, my wife and I went with him, and we got on this big boat. I mean, I'd never seen a boat like this in my life. I mean, it was a big boat. Big salon, big stadiums on each end. It was just an amazing deal. Three or four levels, and I'm going, wow. So I'm standing there in, in this boat in the big salon area, and I remember I had my, my hand in my pocket, and I was talking. And I said to him, I said to him, man, I said, who in the world is buying these kinds of boats? And I remember his, his response was a classic. He didn't blink an eye. He didn't miss a lick. He didn't miss a step. He looked right, looked right at me and he said, well, sir, he said, I want you to know there's a lot of money in this world. The problem is you and I don't have any of it. <laughs> You don't know what you don't know. And that's true when it comes in many cases as believers to the favor of God or how God's favor works. So I want to share a little bit of that with you. So the first one is favor is attracted to a spirit of expectation and preparation. Secondly, when it comes to that we don't know what we don't know. Secondly, favor is released, I believe, through what I call divine connections and God opportune moments. Let me say it to you one more time. Favor is released to us through divine connections and God opportune moments. Now, I haven't told this story here yet, and so I'm going to tell this one in any of those. I don't think I have in, in the services here. But several years ago, um, when I was pastoring, some of you, I, I usually mention this at, toward the end of the sermon, that I was, uh, we, we were known in, in 1999 as the Columbine pastor. We had four of the Columbine funerals in our church. We had the funeral in our church. And uh, Rachel Scott's funeral was one of the first ones. And I'm not going to go into great detail about any of that today other than let you know 
that there were some things that were happening around Columbine. God, God took what Satan meant for evil and turned it for good. It was amazing to see the people that came into the kingdom through that particular tragedy. But I share that with you because of this. Because until Columbine happened in our church, we, 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 it was after Columbine that we really began to grow and, and we began to experience those, that whole other level of really reaching the city and we were on television and doing the things we did in those days, right? But I'm telling you this for this reason. Before that, we weren't. Before Columbine, we, we, we were just, you know, kind of chugging along. We were having church and we were doing good, but it wasn't like we were exploding with growth or anything great was happening. And I remember uh, one, uh, one day during that season that I'm describing to you is uh, I was standing in a Ford dealership getting my oil changed. Uh, and, and this was in 1997. Now, we, we had cell phones in those days. And they, it wasn't the big brick ones that we see, you know, with the, with the guy with the gremlin. They, they had gotten smaller in 97, 98. And they were a little smaller, but they were analog phones. And so today, with the digital phone, wherever my iPhone is, I wonder what I did with it, wherever it is. But where, that's kind of, I don't usually, I usually have it. But where my iPhone is. <laughs> Wherever my iPhone is, you know, now I can see Pastor Phil is calling me, right? And I can see it says, Pastor Phil, I just hit the climb. <laughs> In those days, it didn't say Pastor Phil. In those days, it said calling. That's all you knew. You didn't know who it was, who was, I mean, it was analog phones. We didn't have digital. It just said calling. And so I remember I'm standing at the Ford dealership getting all changed, and I had this little black cell phone, and I saw it had a little orange, kind of an orange little screen on it, and it said calling. And so I figured, well, there's only a couple people in the world that have that, my number in those days, and so my wife, of course, is one, and my, my secretary worked with me those 26 years I was telling you about. She, she had it, and then my, my kids were coming up about the age, and so they had it. So well, I figured it's one of the four, and so I said hello, Right? Didn't tell me who was calling, so I said hello. And uh, they, the, other, the, the person was a man on the other end of the phone, and he said, is this Pastor Billy Epperhart? And I said, uh, it is. And I'm thinking, how did this guy get my number? I'm, that's what I'm thinking. And I'm thinking, my secretary had to give it to him. I mean, that's how it had to happen. So I'm thinking, boy, if she gave me my number. So I said, how can I help you? And uh, he said, we're talking about favor. He said, I have a cassette tape of yours that you preached. And he said, I would like to know if we can start publishing your cassette tapes. I said, really? I said, who are you and where are you and how does this work? He said, well, a certain man who I did not know sent us, we're talking about divine connections in Cairo's moments, how favor works. He said, a certain man, who I didn't know at that time, sent me two of your tapes. Now remember, folks, young people, in those days we had cassette tapes. Now I know you don't know what a cassette tape is, right? And cassette tapes were, you do, okay? And cassette tapes were after eight-track tapes. And eight-track tapes were after reel-to-reel -reel tapes. You understand, okay? So this was in the day of cassette tapes, right? That we didn't have CDs, MP3s, and all those stuff we have now, right? Digital downloads, all that. So uh, he said, I have two of your tapes. And, and so he told me, I said, well, how does this work? He said, well, how it works is you send us the tapes, we publish them, and then we, we send you a royalty fee. Well, when he said royalty, or, 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 yeah, yeah, royalties, my ears <laughs> perked up. And I said, well, tell me, how much are we talking about and how does that work? And so he said, well, we give you X amount per tape. And I said, well, well how many tapes do you sell? Oh, he said, we send them out every week. He said, we sell, and he told me, and, you know, like 30,000 tapes a week we sell. So I'm saying, so you're telling me you pay this much per tape to me and you guaranteed to sell 10,000 a week. He said, yes, we're guaranteed to sell 10,000 a week, guaranteed, and we want to send two of yours out a month. 
I said, we don't even know each other. He said, yeah, we do now. We've listened to them. We're going to edit them, clean them up a little bit, but we want your stuff. He said, I'm sending you a royalty agreement. It was basically a small two-page contract. We're going to send you a contract in the, in the mail. You sign it. Now, folks, i got to be honest with you. I was blown away. In fact, the, the tapes that he had gotten, I've been doing the stuff like with, with Paul Milligan, right? That goes back to 2000. This was in the mid-90s, some of this stuff that was taught. And I was teaching a group of business people in our church on Saturday mornings. And the one tape they got, here's how it worked. If you were a visitor and you visited, you got a visitor packet, right? And you got a choice of, in those days of one of two tapes. One was called Seven Steps to Reaching Your Dreams, which is now called A Big Enough Dream. And the other one was called Five Characteristics of a Healthy Family. Well, this man who came, he took the seven steps to reaching your dreams for himself. And his wife took five characteristics of a healthy family in her packet. And they sent both, they listened to him, and they sent both of them off to this place. This guy calls me. Now, I mean, i got to be honest with you, folks. He wants to publish th the tapes that I'm doing. And if we sold five tapes on a Sunday morning after I preached on Sunday morning, we thought we were having a landslide. <laughs> so I said to him, how much, how, much do, how much do I get paid? And he's telling me I'm adding up my head. And I'm thinking... If this guy's really telling the truth, I'm going to make more money from selling cassette tapes to a month than I do in my whole pastoral salary. I thought, what a deal. And I remember, I can't get no help, and I'm trying. I mean, we're talking about the favor of God. And, and so he sent me the contract. I signed it. And still today, in 2014, I still get royalty checks from some of those tapes. Can you imagine? I, 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 I call that a Kairos moment. God showed up with favor, reached down, pulled me in a out in the ozone of Colorado somewhere and pulled me up above the other kings. Now, I'm not, I'm not telling you that story to make me a big deal because I'm not a big deal. I'm telling you that story to let you know that God shows favor, come on now, and he shows up to a spirit of expectation and preparation. And watch this, he does it through divine connections and Kairos moments. I had no idea that couple had walked into the back door of our church. I had no idea. I had no idea they got a visitor packet. Because in that days, we were large enough. We had a big foyer, just not to go into do. It was a big foyer. You couldn't see everything everybody coming in that was impossible to do so I couldn't meet everybody and we had a visitor reception after every service every Sunday morning we had a special visitor place and all of that and I would go to that right well the Sunday I went in there I went in and they weren't in there that they had left right that they didn't stay for that I didn't meet them until about six months later it took, took they, because they traveled a lot so they were gone and finally about six months later I finally met them and I'm thinking you people changed my life and it took me six months to meet you, but you know what I'm saying. But the point I'm making is there are divine connections in Kairos moments that God shows up to show you favor. My second grandson, our second grandson, was born, I told him this morning, with his major arteries reversed. And uh, it was a very obviously traumatic moment because the doctors were not prepared for it. We, and it was at Denver Children's Hospital. We live in the city of Denver or on, in the suburbs of Denver. So he, his mother was getting great medical care and attention, but the doctors did not see it on any of the scopes or anything they did. They missed it completely. So when he was born, they weren't prepared for it. So there was a mega emergency we didn't really understand until about 30 minutes in. Well, what we did know is about two weeks before he was born, the leading TGA surgeon in the world from Paris, France, came to work at Children's Hospital in Denver, Colorado. We did not know that. He left just a few mo mo months later after my grandson was born. But while 
my grand, when my grandson was born with that TGA, that doctor was there and he performed the surgery personally on my grandson. Now, you can call it whatever you want to call it. And I believe in divine healing. I believe in divine health. But I want to tell you, call it whatever you want. And I believe the favor of God showed up and put that man from Paris, France, just for my grandson for that particular time. And because of that, he's playing soccer, baseball. He's a completely normal kid today. With By all reasons and all measures, he's a completely normal kid today. I believe God will reach down in favor and pull you up. I believe God will find you where you are in the corner of nowhere, in the corner of the wilderness and show his favor to you because God shows up to a spirit of expectation and preparation and he shows up in divine connections in Cairo's moments. I believe that. And then lastly, in fact, let me say this to you. God has people for your life that you have never met. God has people for your life that you never met. I like to say it this way. In fact, I teach this piece in the business school, this particular one. I believe that there is a treasure chest that God has full in his grace of kairos moments and divine connections that are for your life and for your life. The sad thing is many people never even open the lid. The reason I get up every morning and speak the word like I do is because I'm believing by, the, by faith, the spirit of faith. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 12 says, we don't fight the devil, we fight the good fight of faith. The devil's already been defeated. Amen. We fight the good fight of faith. So if we're fighting the good fight of faith, I believe as I'm fighting the good fight of faith, I'm opening the treasure chest on divine connections and Kairos moments being released over my life in the favor of God. Amen. So Isaiah 43 says, I have, God said, I have given people for your life. So what that's saying is God's got people that you've never met that can help get you where you need to go. God's got Kairos moments in your life that you've never experienced yet because God has those Kairos moments to get you where you need to go. Amen. That's how favor comes to our life. And then number three is favor is found in the places that God has prepared for you. Now, I've already mentioned Columbine here today, but I want to tell you straight up, I know what it's like to hold the hand of a grieving mother and have to walk into the mortuary and see at point-blank range on the temple where a shot was given at point-blank range and, and, and hold her. I know what it's like to have to go into the Word of God and tell people what the word says about God and his purpose and plan and all of those things. I've been there. And over 30 years of pastoring, I've preached a lot of funerals. But those obviously were the most traumatic. I share that with you for this reason. One of the verses that I use is, is uh, John chapter 14. Jesus said, my father's house are many mansions. Right? We're not so I would have told you. But he said, I go to prepare a place for you. We, I still use that today uh, in, some, in some instances in a funeral setting if I'm conducting the service. So I believe that. However, I also believe it's for here and now. I believe God's got places prepared for you. Yes. In other words, in the same way that he's got Kairos moments and divine connections, I believe there's metrons and measures of rule and places that God wants you functioning in, no matter who you are, where you are in life, I believe there's places God has prepared for you. So what we don't know, for example, and I give this illustration about the nation of Israel, when, when, when Israel got ready to go into the promised land, what we don't know, or sometimes we don't know the history as well, is that, that when the ten spies went in and they came back, and the Bible says they came back with a bad report, the two spies, Joshua and Caleb, went in, the Bible says they came back with a good report. The Bible says very plainly there were walled cities and giants in the land. In fact, it even says that we were in their own sight, the ten spies, we were in their own sight as grasshoppers. So there was real obstacles there, but a lot of people don't know the history as well to know this, that around 200 years before, over a period of 150 years, the Egyptian army, which the a nation of Egypt in those days was kind of like the U.S. is today. They, it was the preeminent nation, right, in that, in that history, in that time frame. They had began to withdraw, oh, the pharaohs had, 
had, over a period of 150 years, they had begun to withdraw the armies that were occupying the promised land. Now, you don't read that directly in the, in the scripture, but historically that's a fact. They began to pull them back, and what they were doing is they were getting, God was getting the promised land ready. For the, for the nation of Israel to go in, come out of the wilderness, and possess it. So here's what I believe. When those places are prepared for you, like the nation of Israel, that's why God said in Numbers chapter 13 in verse 2, he said, I have given you the land. The reason he said that before they had ever gone in is he knew he had caused those armies to start coming out of there. And because they came out of there, that land was prepared for them. Didn't mean it was a cakewalk. Didn't mean it was easy, but it did mean he had prepared it for them. So I like to say it this way, God allows us to possess what has been dispossessed. Let me say it to you one more time. God allows us to possess what has been dispossessed. Now you're the first group of the three that I'm going to share this with. I am convinced when God said in Joshua chapter 24 and verse 13, I have given you a land for which you did not labor and cities which you did not build and you dwell in them. You eat of the vineyards and the olive groves which you did not plant. In other words, what God does is that every day in this world, there are, there are billions of dollars every second, excuse me, in this world every day, every second of every day, there are billions of dollars that change hands in a moment of time. There is something that is being dispossessed and there is something that is being possessed every second. Are you listening? So when I say God allows you to possess what's been dispossessed, that does not mean he's going and knocking somebody on the head and just aggressively taking away. It means that there are things that are already been, this church that you're in today was being dispossessed, right? And you were able to come in and possess it. Praise the Lord. And it helped the church. It was a win-win. It helped the people that were trying to sell it. And it helped you as a congregation. Every day in this world, something is being dispossessed so that we're able to possess it. So when I pray in the mornings, one of the things I pray is I believe you've given me lands I did not labor, cities which I did not build. The very same thing that happened to the person that took the five, turned it into five, and got the one. He got the one because it was a land he didn't build. Amen. So the favor of God here today shows up to a spirit of expectation and preparation. The favor of God comes through divine connections and Kairos moments. And the favor of God comes to places that God has prepared for you. Evidently, this church, this place had already been prepared for you as a congregation. Amen. I said amen. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me? And I want to pray for you right now. We're going to release the grace of God, the faith of God. Thank God today. We're going to connect with the grace of God right now in our faith. Father, we thank you in the name of the Lord Jesus for the favor of God in our lives. Now this morning, no matter where you are, what you're facing, what challenge you may have, I want to pray for you. And I, I heard this before the service, Pastor Phil. I haven't done this in any service uh, yet. But I want to specifically pray this way. And, and coming down the hallway from your office to come in here to be seated this morning, I heard the Holy Spirit speak to me. And so I, it kind of checked me for a moment because I was just going to play a, a quick general prayer. I'm still going to play a quick prayer. But I heard direct, real direction in it today. And so here's what I want to do. I want to pray today over everybody in the building. Uh, a general prayer I'm going to pray. But I want to pray over your finances. I've been praying over favor in general, but this morning I just want to pray specifically over your finances. And then for those of you that are in, in the area of maybe you're, you're in business or whatever, uh, you have businesses, whatever, assets, I want to pray over that as well because I believe that in this house, this house is a great resource because, because I believe there's this place is getting ready. The seeds of greatness are in it. And for you to go where you need to go, people have to be increased in order for that to happen.
So as I pray this prayer of, of favor over your life today, over your finances, I want you to receive that. And let's, let's, let, let's, let's get in the harness together spiritually in the power of agreement over this specifically. So whatever you're facing right now in that arena of your life, or maybe you're wanting to go to the next level, whatever it is, let's believe God now favor is released over you. Father, in the name of Jesus right now, I lift up your people. And I pray this morning over their finances. I pray right now that the favor of God is released in this house over them. It's released over this house. In addition, Lord, I pray for every man and woman, boy and girl in here today. I release my faith with them. I join with them in agreement that, Father, that favor is released over their finances. And then I lift those up that have businesses in this house today. I pray right now over them for the favor of God. Everywhere they go, everything, everything they set their hand to do, I pray over them today in that arena that the blessing and favor of God is released over them. In Jesus' name, we pray. Now, pray this with me say today, today I, receive I receive the favor of God, favor of God over, my over my life and over my business, over my business. In, Jesus name. in Jesus name amen, amen. we pray that you were blessed by this message if you are curious about our ministry or would like to talk to someone you can contact us through our website believerschristianchurch.com